Welcome to OpenCon Virginia. Um, I am Hillary Miller. This is uh, the first in what I hope will be maybe an annual or, or continuing event. Um, I'm so excited to have so many of you here. Um, as a, a quick rundown, we've got librarians and faculty and students from institutions um, of all types from across the state. We've got people from out of state, from out of the region. Uh, we have got some excellent keynote speakers, presenters, lightning talk uh, presenters. Um, we are, we have a hashtag, OpenConVA. Please tweet and take pictures to your heart's content. Um, if, you, if you get any good ones, you can send them to me after the event as well. Um, and very quickly, I want to thank all of the support, uh, thank VCU Libraries for all of the support for putting, for putting on this event, as well as the uh, Virginia Scholarly Communications Interest Group, which is a statewide group of librarians who have provided a lot of support um, for, for putting on this event as well, so thank you. Um, and now we will move to our first speaker, um, Hilda Bastian. She uh, works at the NIH on uh, clinical effectiveness and research accessibility. Um, she works for the PubMed Health Team. She uh, is the lead for PubMed Commons, and I will not read you the rest of her bio because it's there in your schedules, and I want to give plenty of time for her. Uh, so please, everybody, welcome Hilda. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for um, coming to hear um, this first talk. I'm really delighted to be here. It's uh, very cool to be at any kind of open con and, uh, um, and it's a lot of my favorite uh, subjects. I'm going to, I've used this title, uh, Open Access Principles, but the first thing that I need to say is that everything that I say is my personal opinion only. I'm uh, off the clock having a long weekend and uh, nobody should be held responsible for, uh, for my views and probably nobody else shares half of them anyway. So when uh, Hillary talked to me about to, about today and I saw the program, uh, I was actually really pleased to see that it had so much about reproducibility and uh, a whole lot of other issues, open learning, open education, uh, and a really sort of wide-ranging view of open access. So why then did I end up with a title? And she said that she was really interested in me talking about bias as well. So why did I end up giving up the title Open Access Principles and Everyday Choices? To some extent, that only makes sense if you know uh, a bit about where I come from. Uh, and I don't mean country, I come from Australia, but uh, uh, my background was originally not in science, not in any of these things. I didn't go to university, I don't have any, I don't come from any particular discipline, anything like that. I was a consumer advocate and very involved in a very controversial issue uh, in which I started to collect data. I was one of those people that was the, the way that people actually really encouraged people to, to be now, very, very engaged. I became what you'd call now a citizen scientist. Uh, I was very, very having an awful lot of impact in the media in my country and all that kind of stuff. The only problem was that it turned out that I was absolutely wrong about what I was advocating for. Uh, and it wasn't minor because people actually died as a result. Uh, and that is actually then what turned me into moving very much into the whole evidence-based medicine world uh, and becoming very, very, very serious about trying to minimise bias and becoming very serious about systematic reviews. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not as much into uh, meta-analysis as I am, this, this, uh, this particular cartoon might make uh, so much sense. Uh, but we are all in this, this situation now where we actually have this absolute flood of information, of, of studies, of people's ideas, of, of claims and things pushing and pulling us backwards and forwards. And so that process then of trying to work out, well, how do you actually work out what we actually know? What is, what is actually reliable? What can I, uh, how can I be sure I don't, as, as, as it's humanly possible to be, that I don't make a mistake and I don't mislead people? There's this one level, there's that that issue of the decisions that we make for ourselves, uh, but the decisions that we make for ourselves can affect other people. Uh, and certainly the minute we start to advocate something or try to make a system change or make choices about where we put our energy and our time, <clears throat> we can actually st be starting to influence others and hurt others as well. So I have this intense interest in epidemiology and, and different methods for minimising bias, whether it's social bias, cognitive bias, research bias, statistical bias. Uh, 
Because in the end, it's not enough to mean well. Most of us think we're good people. Um, most of us intend to do well or certainly don't intend to do harm. But it's actually very, very hard to separate out those things and to see our own uh, what's in our own interests because often the reason that something seems good to us and feels good to us is because it's actually good for us uh, or it's good for uh, what we believe in or whatever. So if we want to try to navigate our way through all of those problems, principles matter a lot, um, but they're absolutely not enough uh, because that's all in theory to some extent. Uh, effects actually really matter. Um, and it's not enough to just believe something strongly and get swept away. Um, and the minute we're involved in that area of saying that we're people who actually want to make things better for other people, we're actually at quite high risk of getting swept away um, by things that, that may not be true that we get excited by. Now, I love this. This comes from uh, Aaron McKinnon and, and uh, John McKinnon's uh, website, uh, whyopenresearch.org. And that reminds us, of, in a sense, of all of the, the positive benefits that we're hoping to see out of open science, open access, open all those other kinds of things, that we increase access to education, stimulate innovation, accelerate discovery, facilitate collaboration, increase diversity of perspectives, improve reproducibility, encourage citizen science, and uh, exchange knowledge. Now, you could probably add things to that, but this is a really great kind of summary of, uh, of, of what it is that we hope to achieve. Everyday choices was the other part of what I put in the title. And that's because oftentimes we can think that it's only big things that matter. Uh, but in fact, it's our everyday choices that build uh, who we are, uh, but it also builds the culture. Uh, culture just isn't something that, that just appears uh, you know, because of like big levers being pulled and changing, um, we actually all shape the culture of, of wherever it is that we are and whatever communities that we're members of. Make me cultures and countercultures and subcultures, but they're all made up in the end of people. Uh, and just as you can have vicious circles, you can have virtuous spirals as well. So uh, there's that whole thing of that who we are and what we do actually does uh, have a really big impact. And there's just so many uh, everyday little choices that we make all along the way. This is, uh, this is from Virginia Valian, where she's actually talking about what is it that, that makes up uh, gender bias. And she came to the conclusion when people, when people would say from a, a lot of research that they did at MIT, this was many, many years ago, uh, the research that this was, this was done, it sort of like really dates, uh, dates you if, you, uh, if you're really uh, still quoting this, I suspect. Um, but she, she would have this, this uh, really important insight that said that people would always say, oh, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. She came to the conclusion that, in effect, mountains are actually a bunch of molehills all piled up one on top of the other. Uh, and so our everyday choices matter. There's all sorts of uh, uh, little things then that we can do and not so little things. Sometimes people have got a really, uh, uh, a really kind of fixed idea of exactly uh, how things have to happen in open science or whatever. And I think for most things, we don't actually really know yet. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of things that, that kind of could succeed and don't. Um, and people can kind of poo-poo some of the smaller things that you can do, uh, but together they add up to something quite large. So, for example, green open access and people starting to have institutional repositories if they gather together more and make that more discoverable, so for example, there's a, a link out now if an institutional rep repository wants to, uh, has qualifying materials that can end up with a link out in PubMed, which really enormously increases access uh, to those, those things. Um, but a whole lot of, of very, very different strategies and different contributions could end up uh, actually changing uh, a big picture. Some of those are quite big but they also involve an awful lot of uh, smaller things that, a lot, that we all have to do. So for example, supporting preprints, which is another thing that can really uh, increase access uh, to research, especially when people for whatever reason uh, really need to publish uh, in a journal, for example, that's not open access. These kinds of things can actually really help, uh, help solve a lot of the problems that, uh, that people who don't have access to a lot of subscription journals and so on have. 
but an awful lot of small steps and support has to go into these things. There's a lot of risks, really, with things like preprints. If you're not a person that's got access to a lot of people to make sure that that very first version that you post is very, very high quality. Um, so th there's a lot of sort of support that can be there for people to help people uh, actually do the kinds of things that a really good journal would do um, uh, that, that you mightn't have access to. Um, open data, for example, is something that I believe in quite passionately, but having uh, gone that route, as many people here would know, this is an awful lot of extra work uh, and a lot of extra skills. So we actually need, uh, if these things are going to be realistic changes, to get a lot more tools and skill building and just plain support to make it happen. I said before that principles and effects matter. And they matter at three different levels. In a, in a way, uh, a lot of what we're talking about in the, across the agenda today are around those first two circles that I've put there at the top. The scholarly work itself, those things that, that would make the work more reproducible or whatever. Communication, so those, those methods of scholarly communication so that the materials and the products and, and the findings uh, and the data or whatever are, are open access. But principles and effects also matter in terms of advocacy. Um, as, I, as I was sort of trying to say before, if we get our advocacy wrong, we advocate for the wrong things, this is no different to uh, a healthcare treatment, um, of people sort of giving somebody the wrong healthcare treatment, whatever. You can do harm, there's opportunity costs if you did that and you didn't do something else that was more effective, all sorts of things. Um, but we often forget that there are principles uh, involved in advocacy as well, uh, and that the effects of what we advocate is something that we should be concerned about. We have a real problem in, inherently, and I think it happens particularly when things start to get polarised, that people start fighting bias with bias. Um, these things don't equal each other out. Um, they just increase the amount of bias. That's all that that actually does. Um, and it's a very quick way sometimes to get people enthusiastic about something. Um, but in the long term, it's hard to know that that actually really is effective because it also repels a lot of people, uh, a lot of people too. There can be a very fine line between idealis idealism and becoming ideological. Uh, and there is a real risk of that, particularly in anything that's a social movement and where you're getting caught up in in the, what everybody is around you is getting excited by. This is a, uh, from Arthur Miller, uh, Arthur Miller's autobiography, and he said, nothing is as visionary or as blinding as moral indignation. Uh, we often look at these things as the sort of the positive side of it and say how great social movements are, for example. But remember, one of the, the biggest first social movements in health is the anti-vaccination movement. I mean, as soon as there were vaccines, this social movement arose. Um, none of these things are necessarily inherently benign. Uh, and it can actually, your enthusiasm can really blind you to an awful lot of things. We're quite good at picking when we're being manipulated uh, by people that we might consider bad guys or whatever, you know? So, so, so my neck of the woods, people are very, very good at picking conflicts of interest from big pharma, right? But less so from people who are trying to advocate something that they consider to be a good thing. Uh, that doesn't make it less of a problem. Uh, and in fact, we're actually more susceptible to manipulation uh, from, uh, from, the, from the people that we don't actually, you know, that we're not kind of, we don't have our guards up, um, whatever. So we actually need to increase our immunity to the things, to, to sort of falling for something that's something we want to believe as well as the things that we don't want to believe and to be just as critical of those things. The other thing that I learned as a consumer of it really quite early on is that principles can clash. Uh, there's, a, there's some basic consumer rights that was first enunciated by, uh, enunciated, probably not a good word, that were first sort of spelled out by uh, John F. Kennedy actually here in uh, uh, quite a long time ago, clearly, uh, where they said these are the basic consumer rights. And two of them are, well, are the right to access and the right to safety. Um, you think about those things. Think about that, for example, for drugs. And you'll see inherently there's this constant tension between the right to safety and the right to access. Uh, 
Um, for something like drug evaluation and drug, uh, drug availability, these things are intensely hard for consumer advocates to, to deal with and find uh, that kind of balance in there. But that's an example of all of the kinds of things. Uh, uh, this, this can always happen. And you can have principles or values from one area that clash with the principles and the values that you have in another. Uh, and uh, all of them can be very, very hard to live up to. We really can't entirely live up to uh, our values and our principles. All we can do is try. Um, but that, that means that we've got to be very, very careful about being kind of self-righteous or whatever because we're really not going to be living up to our own values anyway. This one is just uh, as an example of a particular uh, battle that I went through. Um, I'm a cartoonist and who really believes in open access. So originally when I started cartooning, uh, I wanted to make them all CC BY and say absolutely no restriction on use. That died uh, of agonising death within, uh, within a short, fairly short period of time, although it felt very long at the, at the, at the beginning. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I had uh, companies that I had personal enormous problems with, wanting to use them to advertise their products, and stick them on you know, advertising materials. I had people going around taking a cartoon of mine and photoshopping it and putting their own opinions and whatever into the thought bubbles uh, and making memes out of my pictures with things that often still with my name on it, but either way, to me, identifiably mine, with points of view that I absolutely, uh, totally, totally disavowed. Um, and I had to sort of accept at that point, well, look, I can't make these things open access. I did have to restrict it to non-commercial use and, uh, um, and for people not to change them. Um, and that kind of that may sound uh, that may sound obvious, but people are going to have all sorts of reasons in their own particular contexts of why of why at certain times they have to make an exception uh, to things that they otherwise believe in. One of the things that's a really interesting phenomenon to me in the whole open field is that you get people who are very, very strongly committed to open everything, except when it comes to peer review. And suddenly, they're into double blinding and um, as, though it's a, as though it's a drug trial, you know, it's, it's some kind of, uh, as though it works like that, this complex uh, human process. And over time, it's taken me a long time to reconcile the conflicting concerns that, uh, that I have over this and eventually decide, okay, I'm absolutely, believe that openness in peer review is critical. I've got uh, some blog posts about this that you can sort of watch my uh, opinion of this change over time if, if you're really interested. But one of, the, one of the issues about this is that the evidence that we've got, the best evidence that we've got, is that, uh, op that double blind peer review or blind peer review does not reduce uh, bias, does not actually end up making things better for anyone but it may make things worse in a, in a range of ways. Um, that's at the individual level, but whenever we look at issues like what are the, the positives and what are the potential negatives of something, uh, we also have to look at what that means at a systems level. And the cost at the systems level uh, of what you can't do because peer review is blinded is actually quite enormous. Uh, so many of the things that might actually enable some of the underlying problems that, that blind peer review is meant to solve um, could, actually be, could actually be prevented from uh, improving because peer review is blinded. Um, so those are, the kinds of, those are the kinds of things that you can only actually really start to see when you actually get really quite serious about going, okay, are we, how are we just going to look at the evidence here um, and apply our values to it? And people are going to come quite legitimately to different positions about it until there's a kind of an overwhelming uh, amount of evidence that, that can push people in one way or the other. But we all know that that actually really happens. Um, I mean, there are, there are issues like, I, I think, uh, water fluoridation, for example, is a classic. It wouldn't matter how many millions of people uh, you showed uh, uh, benefited from, uh, you know, were in studies that showed benefit from, from fluoridation, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. People's views will never change, no matter how much evidence uh, there is. So it really just becomes this case of at what point are you convinced? And we all get convinced by things at different points, at different rates. 
Um, but this is a classic uh, example of an issue uh, where people's different values can, uh, can clash. Unintended effects won't always be obvious or, imme or immediate, as they would, for example, with this uh, sign. You pretty quickly find out what was wrong with that. Um, we really do have to try and think through uh, what, the, what the potential harms might be, particularly of the things that we're encouraging other people to do, and particularly of the things that can have system level uh, effects. I don't really know that in the beginning of the open access movement that people saw this coming, you know. Uh, a lot of those problems that exist around author processing charges is a, is a way forward to get, get past uh, the costs of uh, access. This was a couple of days ago. The University of Oxford has basically told people, please don't submit any articles because we can't afford to pay the uh, author processing charges, right? So RCUK funded authors are there for us to delay submission of new articles to journals until 1st of February 2018. Um, I, I put this up there just as a kind of like a marker for how uh, you can end up with uh, all sorts of consequences down the line. For anybody who has, has been into open access for a really long period of time, there were, there were these kind of articles of faith, if you like, that said things like, well, once there were a lot of these things, author process charges would decrease over time from the competition and this would happen and that would happen. Um, but now we actually have to look at what are the effects and what actually really is happening, separate from, uh, separate from the ideas that we had. One of the answers for one of, one of the solutions that can help us kind of start to sort out which are the things realistically that really aren't doing good <clears throat> is for us to get on top of the things that actually blind us from understanding well what really is uh, doing good and what really is doing harm. One of those is a really big one is confirmation bias uh, and it's very close cousin motivated reasoning where you, you, you come to a position uh, by putting together bits of arguments um, that all seem completely plausible. It's a bit like that thing in health uh, where it doesn't really matter what a study finds, somebody can go back and articulate a very logical, pathophysiological basis for whatever it is uh, that they're seeing. You know, you can always retrofit a story to fit whatever end you want to get to. Um, and so we really have to be careful uh, about that, that, that tendency that we've got to remember the things that support what we believe and keep seeing the things uh, that confirm our beliefs. We've got a, a, we're particularly at risk from things, and this is one of those, those things that should always just send up our, all of our antenna should get nervous. When we see people proposing easy solutions with no little or cherry picked data, um, that is everywhere and at all times a recipe for enthusiasm and error. I mean, I, I tend to be one of those people, I mean, there's a lot of people that say those things, like the more enthusiasm there is, the less data there is, and the, the more data there is, the less enthusiastic everybody is going to be over something. I don't, I, I don't tend to be like that in a sense because I get, I actually get very excited and enthusiastic about large conflicting uh, uh, data sets because I kind of feel like, okay, sure, yeah, this is now really hard, uh, hard to kind of work out what the balance of things here is, but it does mean you're getting closer to truly understanding something, you know, uh, unless, unless you're dealing with something that's a really, really dramatic, uh, a really, really dramatic effect. Uh, this is actually a really useful place to be, but that doesn't tend to be uh, where we get to with things. I'm going to use an example, and I don't, I don't want to, I've kept, mo tried to mostly keep names out of this because this isn't uh, a, a specific thing about the names, but this is a really good example of how bias in open advocacy and open science advocacy uh, can really uh, cause problems. There's this range of headlines, and I've picked one there up at the top, where you'll see in the subheading they say, all, all that psychologists needed to be more open with their data was the promise of a badge showing that they did it. So this is the idea that if you give people badges on their articles for uh, for having open data, for sharing materials, this kind of thing, that, you, that the lure of getting one of those badges is so profound 
It will make people change their behaviour and do it. This, this tweet here um, shows another side of this, of the advocacy around this particular intervention, where somebody said, data shows the effect of badges on transparency is unrivaled by any other known intervention, which is really quite an extraordinary statement for a scientist to make, isn't it? And when challenged about where that comes from, where that comes from is the same, there's a single very small study that's behind that first headline. And then there's a systematic review that includes that study, but it's the only study in that systematic review, right? So that evidence didn't increase in strength by virtue of being in a systematic review. And it's clearly an absurd conclusion because having a, a, a journal, for example, with a mandatory data sharing uh, policy uh, that only lets things through without the data being shared if there's sort of ethical issues around privacy or whatever. Um, there's quite a few examples of those that have extraordinarily high uh, rates of sharing of data, and logically they would. So how could anything compete with mandatory, you know, in that kind of a context uh, with that? So it's a really quite a ludicrous statement. But what you'll see is it comes from this one study that's got, uh, has done everything in a way to exaggerate. If this, was, if, if, if this was all done with a drug, we'd see this a lot more clearly and quickly. Um, but we've got a title here that says that it's a simple, low-cost, effective method for increasing transparency. And if you start to pass that through, there's an awful lot uh, of claims <clears throat> already there in the title. They say it's low cost, but there's no data on cost in there. They say it's effective, but it's not a study type that could actually establish causality. And they say it increases transparency. Now, you'll often see the data from this study presented in the way that I'm showing here. And it's not showing you absolute numbers. It's all done with percentages, which makes everything look um, more dramatic. Uh, and it's often shown like this as before and after data. It was about a single journal introducing a big range of practices of which one of them was the badge. And that's the black line. And it's comparing it to similar journals that didn't add a badge. And then this is what, this is what then it shows. This is how it's then shown, which kind of gets that, can often list those gasps of, oh, wow, and get people really excited. But the numbers that we're talking about here are incredibly small. This is incredibly short term. I mean, the numbers are so small that even the people who advocated the policy change, their own articles, are enough to be a sizable chunk of, uh, of this increase. And then it becomes that question of, well, if it's effective, then we need to actually know what are the possible... If it's going to be effective, then we need to know, is it effective in a net way? So does, uh, do the positive things outweigh the negatives? And it's put forward as this idea that says, look, it's low cost, you have to do almost nothing, and you get this fantastic benefit. So that's actually encouraging people to do nothing except, you know, make virtually no change except offer a badge and, and you're good, right? Uh, if that's not true, then that means there's going to be an awful lot of badges around uh, that, that, you know, have got no relationship necessarily to what happened in the study. Because in this study, it was part of a set of practices that required a whole lot of changes in statistics, in, uh, you know, all sorts of things. It was a suite of interventions um, that were really quite intensive. Um, certainly not low cost by any means. Couldn't have been. So I started to, when I was looking at that and I had seen this presented so often and watched this enthusiasm going like, I just don't understand this from a scientific point of view, how people could get this excited, particularly when they're concerned about reproducibility, you know, in, a, in other contexts, how could this be? How could this thing take off like this? So as a case study, this became a thing of quite intense interest to me. So I was thinking about how could you, if you were going to look at uh, what other effects other than the intended effects there were, uh, what, what could I do that was quick for a blog post to look? So I thought, okay, I'll take those journals and I'll look at their productivity. Now the red one here is the, the one, see here, that says black, and then you've got those grey ones. So the grey ones are the same ones. The red one 
is the one that had the shooting up of the sharing. And the purple arrow shows you when that, the year that that policy came in. So I don't know if this holds, and it struck me when I put this in uh, to this thing, oh, gee, I should add 2017. I don't know whether this is a blip. But it looks like this was accompanied by a really major drop in productivity at that journal. That's not surprising. I mean, people can interpret this in a whole lot of different ways. We don't know because of the nature of, of, uh, of what we're looking at here and the way we're looking at data. We don't know what this means. We don't know if people shifted over to this other journal, which has basically taken the, the lead in number of journals. We don't really know what's going on here. But it raises a lot of questions and it highlights why we need to look at the downsides uh, or the meaning uh, of what this happens. Having a low productivity might not matter at all to that journal. They might be able to even keep increasing their subscri subscription costs at the time they're doing this. Who knows? I, don't, I, don't, I didn't look at that that deeply. But it does suggest that the idea that this package of interventions was of a, a low cost and an easy thing to do and it was just the badges out of everything. The badges are responsible for what you saw. Um, it really casts really strong questions over that. When I published this blog post, somebody got in touch and said, hey, there's another study, didn't you realise, which I hadn't seen uh, because it wasn't specifically a study of open badges. These people, and they had open data because it was in a, a, a journal that requires data sharing, no badges. Um, I could get some of the data out to see, did the data sharing seem to be associated with other things that were in that packet of five interventions. Um, and they were. These tended to be people who also did the statistical stuff and you know, also did these other things. Um, so it really starts to see, well, look, is this just a thing that people were more attracted who, who already did those things to that particular journal? So in other words, was it effective marketing? Um, some kind of natural selection going on, or were other people repelled, whatever. But it's hard to imagine that just the thing of being able to get a badge would make you do all of those other things. You know, that's a, an awful, an awfully small incentive to do an awful lot of things. And apart from anything else, it would be too late to have done sample size calculations before you did your study and all of those, uh, all of those sorts of things. Uh, and one of the other things about that thing when you actually really start to look at the data is that a lot of the people, quite a substantial proportion of the people who were eligible for badges said, no thanks, I don't want you to put the badge on my article. The point of going through that so much is to say, well, there's a, range, there's a whole range, aren't there, here, of the, the, the skills and the issues that cut across the the reproducibility and the good science arguments that we have, and then what happens once we move into the advocacy realm, uh, and why it's important not to let those those kind of those scientific things and those self-critical things to just let them drop off uh, once you move into uh, how you want to change the world. I don't really, uh, I don't really know. I've got a particular point of view. Uh, now um, about these open badges. I came to the conclusion no, I don't think it's a good idea, but then I've been involved in a lot of those kinds of like accreditation processes and thinking that, you know, those kinds of things can really change behaviour a lot. I've got at a systems level because one of the other messages here is that you, you've got to look at the issues at the individual level, but then you've also got to look at what the consequences are for the system. One of the things that this particular screenshot down at the bottom was one of the things that, that was like the straw that broke the camel's back for me on this issue about the badges. Um, I was at home, not at the NIH, so, and I wasn't sort of hooked up to the system, so I hit this paywall for this, this article at that journal that I was interested in, which here you can see if you knew, if you're actually at the journal, if I was at the NIH, that closed access logo at the end would be open on account of at the NIH I would have access to it. At home, though, I didn't. So what we have is open data, open materials, closed article, right? It's as though what we're, what we're doing here, in a sense, is encouraging closed access journals to, to, to get things that are the appearance of openness uh, without, you know, while keeping a fair amount of stuff closed. Um, it's like to go from one extreme to the other for people to say, 
We don't have to have all the data available with the articles that we release because the article is everything. The article is the results of the research and that's all you need. To flip it around the other way and say, well, look, we'll release the data, but the article is not data. <laughs> no. You don't need to see the article. You don't need to see the bits of material about methods and what you might need to understand the data. That you don't need to see. That we can keep closed. And we've seen the consequences in terms of uh, what happened with open access articles uh, and how that got interpreted in publishing and what the, the, the consequences were. I mean, in, in fairness, the argument here is to say what, what we're doing here uh, is putting these journals on a kind of a slippery slope to, to eventually, you know, doing all the really good stuff, right? Um, and, and, and perhaps that's going, going to happen but perhaps it's not, and there's no real evidence yet that, that, that this is a kind of a gateway drug to full openness and, and having everything out there and being a completely open journal. It looks more like a technique for open washing, of giving the appearance of openness um, than anything else. Okay, so I'm gonna try and get a bit more positive in the last stretch. How do we avoid despair? about biases in science uh, because, uh, and in life in general, all of them, the social, political, the scientific, all of them. We don't, it, it's astonishing really when you think about it, how much work has gone into things like the detection of bias uh, and how little, and, and it is paltry, how little research there is on how to protect yourself from bias and how to de-bias. Um, it's actually an extraordinary, extraordinarily colossal mismatch. So almost anything that I say is not going to be, by definition, um, like, like inherently it's not going to be supported by a ton uh, of evidence, but what I could say, I'll give it a go. We do need to build uh, bias minimization skills. Now, the thing is really difficult because we're not actually all that sure of what are the things that work. But I think that there's actually something inherently in the activity of starting to, to of continually building your critical appraisal skills and your understanding of biases and how they work and recognising your own ones. Um, but perhaps, I mean, that, perhaps that's one of my articles of faith that ultimately pays off. Um, Certainly to not do, it seems to me, and to, it, not going uh, to help. One thing that's clear from some studies that people have done with uh, doctors of getting them, you know, not to jump to the wrong diagnosis too quickly or not to be too racially biased against patients that are not from their own race and those kinds of studies, which there's not many, but that's where there are some, says that the most, one of the most important things is to slow down. Don't jump to conclusions. Like that, that's one of your principal things that, that you've got to do. Um, uh, and in this kind of world where we're like tweeting and doing all of these things that actually have this, this real speed associated with it, and society is speeding up at quite an enormous rate. So uh, when we've got a lot to read or we've got a lot to do, you know, we'll, we'll really cut an awful lot of corners. And, and as the amount of research just keeps growing or the amount of information that you could possibly look at, I mean, if you don't want to cherry pick, for most things that means you've got to spend an awful lot of time. Uh, and coming to opinion is going to be a very, very slow process. Um, so it's not entirely realistic, but it's one of the things that we really have to do, at least at the times where we think something really matters. If it really matters to us, one of the first things we've got to do is take our time. Take crit critics seriously. Um, this is actually a really hard thing to do. Uh, I've, you need to kind of, when anybody's criticising you, I'm not one of those people who believes that thing of don't read the comments. Even when I've been slammed by hundreds of Breitbart trolls coming at me when I've upset them for whatever reason, I still read it. And, uh, and it, can, it can be a, a quite painful process. But every now, you, you, every now and then, the, my ground assumption is I'm doing something wrong always at all times or I could do things better always at all times because I'm human and that's just, and I know myself, I make a lot of mistakes. So uh, 
Uh, and also, you can make mistakes in communication. You can sit there and go, I wrote the thing, I know what it says. Um, into that comes everything from recall bias to what you intended to say, uh, all sorts of things. Um, when somebody sort of says, you know, takes issue with something, and you go back and you really look at it, you go, well, they're right. That is what it says. It isn't what I meant, but that is what it says. Um, now, sometimes you can, you can take all your skills of analysis to, to some criticism that you're getting and you can uh, conclude there is literally no point. Um, there is absolutely no content in this thing that I can learn from. And um, there's only a certain amount of time, obviously, that you could spend uh, listening to your critics or you'll go totally crazy. Uh, but, uh, but it's a really quite important thing. And it's not the doing flawed research that's the problem and it's not that coming to a wrong conclusion or making a mistake because that's just life and it's certainly science. The problem is, the problem arises in what do you do when you have made a mistake? Do you keep doubling down? Do you stick to your guns or do you alter your opinion? Are you, are you able to alter your opinion as the evidence shifts? Those kinds of things. That's what in the end really matters. I went through a lot of different things about principles and open access principles and I decided not to include any of them. And I decided to put this one in. This is, a, this is an English thing, so uh, it may not be something that a lot of people here are familiar with, but it's worth having a look at. You can find these seven principles of public life on Wikipedia really quite quickly. It's an English thing. Uh, and it's worth actually looking at because what those principles cover might not be entirely what they appear to be on the surface uh, of it when you first look at it. So, for example, leadership is not just meaning to say you should take leadership roles. Uh, and if you don't want to be that person who's in those roles, you can ignore that. That's uh, not, in, not all that it means. It also encompasses things like if you're a bystander seeing somebody get bullied for whatever, uh, you know, for whatever's happened, um, that as difficult as it is, and like I say, you're not always going to be able to live up to those, thing, those kind of principles, but you should stand up to try and protect whoever it is that's getting bullied. Or, do you know what I mean? It, 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 even if nobody else is and you have to take the lead uh, on those kinds of things. So it's a complex idea, each one of these principles enunciated about, of, about what they mean. I think uh, uh, when we see values... Uh, developed for science and scientists, they often don't have openness in them, which obviously to the people, I presume most of the people in this room, is clearly something that's uh, really quite important. But one of the things that I really like about this one too is the selflessness one. I did this as a, a joke at, one, at uh, one point that I proposed that we needed to, it was about CRISPR, that we needed to uh, edit science's DNA and target and knock out hubris and replace it with generosity. Um, I was actually surprised at one point to hear some people who are into genetics actually starting to discuss, well, that's an interesting idea. I wonder if there is any kind of genetic predisposition. And I was like, oh, for goodness, it was just a joke. Um, but, uh, but it's actually... It's actually probably top of my wish list because when you actually start to think about all the different principles and values and you think what flows from what, and you know, if I had to pick one that we would all be better at, maybe it's just because generosity is something I've often personally had a problem with, um, I would put my, uh, my chips on trying to make people more generous, on people being more generous. And this is what I think generosity in science means. Um, if you're really generous, there is gonna be more diversity, fairness, openness, sharing, collaboration, service and giving. Um, and the, the willingness and ability to do that uh, and uh, for all of us to make it easy for each other to do it uh, is really a very, very big ask. Um, but I think that that's actually uh, the, the way forward. Um, and in the end, uh, though, the main thing that I, I think we have to do is recognise that the biggest bias that we have to deal with is our own. Thank you.
Sorry? Yeah, does anybody want to ask a question or make a, a statement or? Get out of here early card. Okay. Hope that's not a bad song. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there is one. at Virginia Commonwealth University, um, and I'm also a part-time PhD student. Um, so with that, um, and with your talk and discussion, it's, it's wonderful because in, in either realm, student and or staff, you have these questions. And so the question that I have is with this open access and with sharing and being able to get to that um, bias and diversity changing, um, is there a possibility in which there could be a rubric in which the, the students coming up could have opportunities to learn about this because the dynamic of teaching fellows moving forward is learning from those that have done before. So how can, especially in academia, um, students have the opportunity to learn and grow and be a part of open access? Say, for example, if they're in a laboratory, in which case that isn't um, being discussed yet. Yeah, that's a really hard one. And, and you're right, that's often how things happen. But that's actually what got us into this mess uh, to a very large extent. And, uh, and as I watch the thing, to some extent, there's a requirement for the reverse to happen here, uh, that we're actually really relying on a new generation to overturn some of these things. Uh, but that's a part of the reason that we can't be too judgmental because that's asking uh, an awful lot. I mean, you can have a really strong commitment to these things, but the people that you're working with don't have the skills. They've never done it, so they surely can't teach you. Um, and, uh, I mean, we had that same thing with meta-analysis. We had this process whereby uh, techniques that really kind of got developed in the 1970s got strongly adopted by a fairly small community uh, in the 80s and 90s, and then suddenly burst into being this thing that everybody expected to be done on a large scale and there being nowhere near enough people uh, to be able to pass on sufficiently high skills to other people and so you've got an awful lot of very bad uh, meta-analysis. Um, and I, I think that we, to some extent, we're in the same situation now with things like uh, uh, open data. Um, people just don't even... People don't even have the experience. Uh, and then we're starting, we, you, you're looking at, at several of these transitions happening at the same time, like moving away from programs like SBSS and getting into R coding to do statistics and those things. These are not small learning curves. And uh, uh, so I don't entirely have a real easy answer for that, except that people do actually have to find other members of their, other people who can support them. Maybe it isn't going to be the people around them and maybe they're going to have to make some compromises that they're not happy with at this point. Uh, but then that becomes that challenge of how do you not then become socialised into that world. And when you do have the choice and you could do these things, you've now become addicted to this other process because you've actually become... Uh, you know, come to benefit uh, by the old way of doing things or whatever, or it's just too hard. Um, I think that, that that process, I don't have a lot of the answers, but I think that it comes, it's part of the reason I said I was so happy to be at an open con. I truly think that whole thing of, of people sharing um, is going to, to show it. I haven't seen these processes work in a, a way really tends to work even with problems uh, on a large scale where the principles don't get lost. I went through a period of time where I thought it's almost inevitable, it's very George Orwell animal farm that every revolution is destined to fail. You kind of, I went through a period of my life where I started to think it really is like that um, until Wikipedia. 
Uh, and then I watched an, an honest-to-goodness collective for all its problems on an enormous scale uh, actually truly hold on to a set of values. Uh, imperfectly, but on a scale I just hadn't imagined was possible. Um, that kind of revived my uh, um, optimism uh, about the future. The first time I went to a really big meeting of Wikipedians, I just walked out with tons of cynicism washed away, you know. Uh, so uh, I guess there's that thing, if you don't have the support around you, come to an open con, do whatever it is that takes to, you to find the people and the role models, even if they're not where you are immediately, and try to hold on to it and find the things that can help you to keep, keep your values and principles uh, as you get older and you're facing headwinds. I, and each individual is going to find their own. I, I personally, because I'm a visual person, I have things that I keep around my desk that are reminding me, like, th that are like my conscience and watching over me all the time and I occasionally glance at them and feel instantly guilty. Um, those kinds of things. You know, I read George Orwell books every couple of years again and again and again. I can recite them. Um, but everybody's going to have their own ways of trying to do, do that. So, sorry, that wasn't a... Anyway, that's the best answer I've got. All right, thank you so much.